In this episode of the show, we're going to be talking about fixing recording latency. That's coming up on Home Music Studio One. All right. Hey, guys, Dave Maxa here from HomeMusicStudio1.com. Welcome back to the show. And as always, this is the place where you can learn to produce professional quality home music studio recordings, and you can do that even on a limited budget. So let's jump into what I want to cover today. We're going to deal with fixing recording latency. And before we can really address fixing recording latency, we need to address what is recording latency. Latency is the distance of time measured in milliseconds that it takes for your audio to go into your audio interface, be processed, and then come back out again to be heard through either a pair of headphones or say speakers, studio monitors, or something like that. So case in point where latency really can become an issue, maybe you've tried to record a lead vocal and you have maybe uh, opened a track up in your digital audio workstation, you set your levels and you just decided, you know what, I want to be able to hear what I'm recording. So you hit monitor arm uh, or arm monitor, what have you, depending on what your DAW, uh, the, the setting your DAW requires. And then you've pulled in, say, maybe a reverb plug in. You want to be able to hear a little bit of reverb while you're tracking. What you've no doubt noticed, depending on your audio interface, is that there was a lag from the time you actually sang the note till the time you could hear the process of reverb on your voice. Okay, that is what we call latency. Another uh, situation where latency becomes an issue is, uh, you know, I've got a, a keyboard in front of me and I often use this to, to trigger sounds, whether it's drum sounds or play a piano track through a virtual instrument. Uh, maybe you've got a drum kit where you're an uh, electronic drum kit and you're triggering electronic drums, a virtual instrument inside your DAW. Latency comes into play through a MIDI controller, whether that's internally through your audio interface or a separate MIDI controller. As you hit the note on your controller, the time it takes to actually hear the processed result in your ears or in your studio monitors is latency. So there are three primary areas that affect recording latency. Uh, number one is going to be your computer's overall performance. Number two is the performance of your audio interface. And number three is the audio interface drivers and buffer settings. So let's kind of unpack each of these areas. So first of all, let's talk about computer performance. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what I'm running here in my machine. Uh, I'm using Windows 10. So if I open up my, my system settings here, uh, you'll see Windows 10 64-bit. This is a several year old gateway machine that I actually did a little bit of upgrades to hard drives, RAM, some other things, but I'm using it. It's a, got an older quad core processor in each running at 2.6 gigs, eight gigs of RAM. Uh, you'll see the 64 bit OS. And so this is not necessarily a high, high end, even a really modern machine. It's several years old, but the bottom line is latency is affected by the processing ability of any given computer that includes RAM, that includes speed of hard drive, that includes the OS. Now, uh, I'm running Windows, Mac, guys, you, you deal with the same thing. It's just a little different setup, obviously, in your operating system. But things that have drastically affected the performance that I've done to upgrade this machine has to do, first of all, uh, with uh, the, the operating system being a 64-bit. I'm also using the 64-bit version of my DAW, my digital audio workstation. Now, I've done multiple tests, and uh, I've read all the arguments about if you don't have X amount of RAM on your machine, then 64-bit doesn't even use it. But I have done multiple tests with 32-bit uh, versions of a identical project side-by-side -side with a 64-bit version of the same project. And the 64-bit version always used less CPU, even though it was able to access more RAM, I should say. At the end of the day, the 64-bit version always performed slightly better. So that's the first thing I've done. And, and obviously, higher performance affects recording latency. Uh, the second thing is I've gone uh, to the trouble of actually separating my OS drive, my operating system drive from my data drive or my audio capture drive, okay? And you'll see right here, I've got multiple drives. These are actually uh, memory card readers, so there's nothing in them right now, different memory card readers built in. Uh, but this drive right here is actually a single terabyte drive. It's got a little less than that because I'm, I'm dual booting Linux. And uh, so I've got some of that partitioned off for there. The second terabyte drive is what I use as kind of my data drive. Both of these drives are actually 7,200 RPM. 
And then you'll also see a third drive. Now, recently, I did a very large tracking of a project, 64 tracks uh, at once coming off a, uh, a Dante system, Allen and Heath digital console. And so I needed actually a little bit more performance out of my, my machine. I was able to achieve that by adding this guy right here. This is just a solid, straight, uh, solid state SSD, uh, 225 gig uh, drive. And the speed at which this drive performs is well beyond the data transfer rate of speed for my standard drives, even though these are 7,200 RPMs. So having faster drives and the ability to separate your operating system uh, if at all possible, from the drive that you're capturing too, can definitely give you a boost and an increase in performance. Obviously, the faster the machine you have access to, the higher performance of the machine, the more RAM, the faster drives, the, uh, the higher performance in CPU, the lower your latency is going to be. Okay, so that's kind of category number one. Uh, whether you're using a Mac or PC, uh, it's time to do a little bit of homework and Googling with your exact setup and trying to maximize the performance at all possible of your specific machine, okay? Uh, other things outside of hardware changes have to do with not running lots of programs, okay? Things that run in the background, automatic backup programs, uh, Dropbox, things like that, Evernote, Skype, different programs that you may have constantly running in the background uh, are programs that when you're capturing and recording and working on a project, if at all possible, disable everything that's not related to your recording process. And that will also help increase the performance and in many cases can give you a little bump uh, in the lowering of latency, fixing the recording latency issue. Uh, so category number two is the audio interface yourself. Uh, the proper audio interface or the best audio interface that you can get your hands on goes a long ways to fixing recording latency. Let me show you the process uh, and the audio interface that I am using. Now, keep in mind, HomeMusicStudio1.com is all about creating professional quality home music studio recordings on a limited budget. So you, certainly, if you had an unlimited budget, there's a lot of different audio interface options out there. But even within, say, that uh, 150 to up to $300 range. I'm always on the lookout for great audio interfaces with the most affordability possible, but still high quality. And for the better part of a year, I've been using the Scarlett 2i4 from Focusrite. And uh, here's the thing I love about this. It's just a straight up USB audio interface, but I have one feature in here, the input versus playback, okay? You may have read in your audio interface about zero latency. Now, how are our audio interfaces achieving zero latency? Well, how this audio interface does that is simply by rolling this all the way over to input and or balancing the input versus any tracks you've previously recorded with the playback, all right? And what this allows me to do is hear the real-time input from my microphone plugged into either of these two channels, uh, and there's no latency at all. There's no lag at all because it's the signal literally going into the audio interface. Perhaps your audio interface has that functionality. That's what that is designed to give you. Now, what is the trade-off? The trade-off is with this setup right here, even though I have zero latency, I don't have the ability to have uh, effects so where I can actually hear real-time effects while I'm tracking any given uh, vocal track or guitar or what have you. So unless I'm generating the effects prior to the input, then I don't have an ability to actually hear effects while recording a dry signal. Now that's important because you don't want to capture anything that you can't live with in post-production. So how does an audio interface potentially overcome that? Well, let me show you an option right here. This is uh, one of the more popular versions of an audio inter interface that actually has real-time internal processing for effects. So there is a, a CPU, actually multiple CPUs, depending on the audio interface, uh, from Universal Audio, one of the more popular ones. There's lots of them out there that actually do this. Uh, sometimes we refer to this feature as DSP processing. In fact, uh, Focusrite has a couple of audio interfaces that do that as well. Uh, and the idea with uh, the real-time processing of effects is that it has an internal processor that takes the load off your machine, thereby keeping uh, performance of your, your digital audio workstation high, not getting any lag or delay in there. And the better uh, audio interfaces that have internal effects processing, DSP or UAD processing, such as the universal audio, in some cases, in fact, most cases, can get that latency number down to two to three milliseconds. Uh, that is actually virtually inaudible when you're tracking, okay? So these are very stable, 
the very usable audio interfaces if you want to have real time effects. Okay. Now, obviously, these interfaces are going to be on much more the higher side. The Apollo Twin starts in the neighborhood of five, six hundred dollars, and then they go on up from there. Okay. So, um, depending on the audio interface and the budget that you have access uh, to, you may be able to deal with that latency issue by just getting a different audio interface that can uh, allow you to have those real time effects on board or making sure you have an audio interface. If you're okay with a dry signal monitoring that, then find one with zero latency monitoring that allow you to monitor that input. Now, what's another solution where maybe you don't have the budget for something like the Apollo, uh, but yet you're dealing with an audio interface like this, and maybe you've got a few other pieces of gear laying around in your repertoire. Here's one thing that's uh, an idea that I'll throw out that I've used in the past along the lines of kind of trying to make use of what uh, you might have available. This is a Mackie Pro FX12. Uh, this is a subcompact mixer that actually has built-in effects. There's a lot of different versions and brands of these around. Uh, my argument in this video is not about uh, what mixer is better and what isn't, but here's just an idea that might spur some, some thoughts for you. Uh, anytime you can separate your recording line from your monitoring line or your recording signal from your monitoring signal, you then have the ability to monitor with effects potentially in real time and still record a dry, clean uh, track so that you can process that inside your software for post-production later. Now, how would you do that with a mixer like this? Uh, I actually own this mixer. Uh, I used to have a Z14 that didn't have onboard effects uh, from Alan Heath. It was a wonderful mixer, but I came across this on a really affordable deal, and so I picked this up and then uh, I do an awful lot of podcasting and videos, and so I actually use this mixer to allow me to blend my audio interface audio uh, in the DAW with the mic, and uh, you know I've got some inserts, so I use compression going into the, the narration and the voiceover. But here's how you could use a, a mixer like this that has onboard effects uh, or even a send and return to have real-time effects and track a dry signal. If I simply plug my microphone in one of the XLR channels, uh, and then on the back of this mixer is also XLR left, right, out. I can take those outputs, input them to channel one and two on my focus right. In fact, I've done this many times and I actually need to enable the pad to do this. And then the gains need to be all the way down because the signal is so hot, okay? But that actually makes for a very clean signal going into the audio interface, all right? Uh, and again, this argument is not about uh, is this the best preamp or not the best preamp? This is just an idea that might spark something for you, okay? So essentially, you're using this mixer as a preamp in this case. And when I do that, uh, I usually leave the EQ flat, maybe do the roll off if I don't have that option on the mic. And the, the uh, input gain is controlled then by the output fader on this particular mixer, okay? So I send a nice dry signal through the stereo out on the back of this left, right, and then the main and the channel out is what drives how hot that uh, that microphone is going to be. Now that's the, the recorded signal, gives you a nice clean signal. The cool thing is then I have the ability to then take the monitor output and I actually own a SM Pro Audio HP6E, which is a, a headphone amplifier. It's a six channel headphone amplifier. It allows me then to take this uh, this balanced output from the monitor send and input it into that headphone amplifier. And then I can control the volume of my monitor signal separately from the gain signal I need to send into my audio interface for tracking. And it also allows me to add effects to the monitor signal by using the auxiliary outs, okay? You might have a mixer that is similar. Uh, I've also had a mixer that didn't have onboard effects and I've used my pod, my guitar pedal, uh, at, through the send and return to add effects and then uh, the same subcompact mixer allowed me to send a, an effect signal into the monitor signal, okay? So this is an effective way to separate the, the recording track uh, signal from a monitor signal. Uh, back in the early 90s when I used to record through an analog board, we might have 128 channel board, the first 24 of those channels uh, in kind of that digital analog half and half days of the late 90s, the first 24 channels would go directly to a multi-track recorder. The, the signal was patched directly off the preamp. That meant anything from the preamp in the channel downward, so the preamp went directly to the recorder. Anything beyond that, like EQs, effects, send and returns, those were all just about monitoring, okay? And so this kind of creates that same way, but you can do that 
with just a two-channel audio interface, all right? Another thought is there are certain preamps. DBX makes a wonderful preamp around the $200 range that offers an XLR output and a direct tip ring sleeve output that would allow you to go XLR into an audio interface and then you could uh, take that quarter inch output, tip ring sleeve output and go to a headphone amp and then you could do whatever you wanted with the monitor signal separately from the tracking signal. So in category number two, those are some thoughts that you can uh, use in order to, uh, to fix recording latency in the audio interface. Obviously, audio interface connections matter as well. So USB versus FireWire, Mac guys, you got the opportunity of Thunderbolt. And so uh, all of those are decisions that the higher performance you can get at the audio interface level, including uh, MIDI controller as well, will certainly make a difference. I should say MIDI interface. Now, this uh, audio interface has MIDI built in. Sometimes you have separate external MIDI uh, interfaces or USB connections for MIDI. The higher the quality, the higher the speed of all those connections in the audio interface uh, arena will lower your latency. Now, the last thing I'll, I'll show you in regards to latency is just simply using the appropriate or the best drivers available in adjusting your driver buffer size. This is actually one of the more simpler things to do in order to lower your latency. And in fact, this is probably the number one cause of really high latency in recording. So let me show you first of all, in Reaper, in the upper right, you'll see I've got 48 kilohertz right here, 24 bit, this is a project open, so sample rate, bit rate. And then the 2i4 has two input channels, four output channels, so that's what that is showing, the in versus the out. Uh, 480 samples is what it's set right now. And then this is showing me that I've got a 22 millisecond input uh, latency and a 32 millisecond output latency, okay? So if I click here, first thing you'll notice is my drivers. Uh, Matt, guys, you can leave a comment in the bottom here. I believe Core Audio is gonna be your optimal drivers. Uh, you can correct me on that. But for PC guys, uh, you definitely wanna try and use ASIO drivers. Find an audio interface that has uh, manufacture audio drivers if at all possible. If not, a second backup will be do a little Googling on the ASIO for all, uh, and that'll get you into an ASIO driver that's a little more generic too. Not quite as stable, uh, but can definitely maybe get a little bit higher performance if you don't have manufactured ASIO drivers. So with that setting, uh, you'll see down here, first of all, as I mentioned, you know, I'm using the ASIO drivers. Uh, also, I should say I'm making sure I'm using the newest version of the ASIO drivers. I'm not trusting the CD that came with my audio interface. I'm going directly to Focusrite, the manufacturer's site, and downloading for my OS the most recent version. So that's important. If I click on the configuration, you'll see this buffer length setting. Now, if I drop this guy all the way down here and click OK, click OK here, what you'll notice now is my latency on the input went down to 4.8 milliseconds and the output went down to 5.8. This is a very effective way to lower the latency in recording. It's going to be compu uh, computer processing power dependent, audio interface and connection dependent, but depending on your machine and those other factors, uh, the lower the buffer setting you can get, the lower your latency will be. Now here's the trade-off. Uh, if you go too far, uh, if your buffer length is too low, for the audio interface and the processing you have available to you, you will begin to get clicks and pops and even dropouts in the audio when you're playing back and tracking, okay? And that's the tracking side of it is the most important. So what you wanna do is play with the balance between a uh, high enough buffer to have good clean input recording signal versus low enough buffer to have a lower latency, all right? Somewhere around three to four milliseconds for me if I'm tracking gives me right about that 10 millisecond range of latency. And most of the time, I'm pretty happy with that, particularly if I'm trying to track a virtual instrument, that is pretty well uh, unnoticeable on latency. Now, the ability to process real-time effects in this setup, uh, really, um, this my machine really just does not do very well. Uh, if Even if I lower that down and say add a reverb plugin on there, I tend to get more dropouts and, and clips and stuff. So I tend to wanna do real-time effects by separating the recording signal from the tracking signal. But in your own system, play around with lowering the buffer to get a lot less latency, but still making sure you've got control on uh, you know, having good clean signal there. Once you're ready to mix and you've got all your tracks recorded, latency then becomes a non-issue 
And I highly encourage you from that point then to put your buffer size all the way up while you're mixing your project. That way you'll get the cleanest sound possible with a lot less chance for clips and pops and cutouts in your audio. So there you have it, guys. Those are kind of my three main categories and suggestions for fixing recording latency. If you got questions, definitely leave them in the comment section below. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to subscribe and click like. Uh, also, make sure for everyone, if you're watching this video and you found it helpful, to share this video with someone else so that others can benefit as well. And lastly, if you've not yet joined us in the online community and subscribe to my free affordable home recording tips newsletter, I want to invite you to do that right now. You can click on the link below. If you're watching this on mobile, you can click on the eye icon in the upper right hand side of your video. And uh, you can go to that uh, link right there. You can drop your email address in. And as a thank you from me to you for signing up on the Affordable Home Recording Tips newsletter, I'm going to send you a free ebook entitled Understanding Compression in the Home Music Studio. Just as a thank you from me to you for joining us in that online community. Again, click the link below to join or the eye icon in the upper right hand side of your video. With that, until next time, this is Dave Maxey with homemusicstudio1.com.